The narration in this video was created with a text-to-speech program, and edited to make it as natural sounding as possible. I understand that some people do not like this, but it was done for numerous reasons. I have uploaded the script to YouTube, so please turn on the subtitles if you wish to mute the audio. Thank you. In Bellevue, Idaho, 16-year-old Sarah Johnson lived a privileged life, with her parents always giving her everything she could ever need or want. Everything except their blessing for her relationship with her boyfriend, 19-year-old Bruno Santos. They forbid her from making contact with him, and as a result, her relationship with her parents soon become volatile. Sarah's parents found out that she had been lying to them, saying she was staying over at a friend's house, but was actually sleeping over at Santos's apartment. One evening, Alan Johnson followed his daughter to Santos's home, and demanded she go back home with him. Alan then told Santos that if he caught him with his daughter again, then he would go to the police and report him for having sex with an underage girl. Alan never went to the police, and days later, he and his wife were dead. On the morning of September 2, 2003, Sarah broke into the guest house, which was on their property, which was unoccupied, as the tenant was away on business. In there, she located the gun she knew was stored in a closet, a high-powered Winchester Model 70 bolt-action rifle. She stole the gun and ammunition, entered her parents' room, and shot her sleeping mother in the face, killing her. She calmly reloaded, entered the bathroom, found her father in the shower, and shot him through the heart. Police officers found the bodies of Diane and Alan Johnson after following up a call from a worried relative. It was immediately clear that Sarah was the shooter, and she was quickly arrested and charged. Although Sarah vehemently denied any wrongdoing, officers were able to find latex gloves and a bathrobe discarded in an outdoor trash can, which contained the DNA of Sarah and both victims. They also found a leather glove which contained Sarah Johnson's DNA and gunshot residue. As Sarah Johnson has always denied committing the murders, no motive could ever be found. Investigators believe Sarah murdered her parents so she could continue her relationship with her boyfriend. Sarah's relatives strongly deny that she could have had anything to do with the shooting, and have continued to campaign for her release. On March 16, 2005, Sarah's case went to trial, and she was found guilty on two counts of first-degree murder, receiving two life terms without parole, plus 15 years. In 2012, Sarah's new lawyer filed for a new trial, claiming her previous legal counsel were ineffective and unprepared for such a big case. In October 2014, the request for a new trial was denied. Sarah Johnson is currently housed in the Pocatello Women's Correctional Center. By age 12, Christopher Pittman had run away from home several times, and as a result, spent several weeks at a facility for runaway children. Whilst there, he was put on the drug Paxil to treat mild depression, and was sent to live with his grandparents, Joe and Joy, in Chester, South Carolina. His grandparents were strict, but they gave him the stable life that he craved, and Christopher soon showed signs of improvement. However, his new doctor in Chester, was unable to prescribe Christopher the drug Paxil, so instead, issued the drug Zoloft. Although both drugs are similar, it is strongly advised to never mix the two drugs together, as it can result in hallucinations, aggression, and delusions. Immediately after taking the new drug, everyone noticed a change in Christopher, who became erratic and jumpy, with his sister describing him as manic. Christopher also complained that he felt like his whole body was burning from the inside. After hearing of the worrying side effects, his doctor did not stop the new medication, but instead, doubled the dosage. On November 28, 2001, Christopher got into an argument with a classmate, which ended with him attempting to choke the other boy. That afternoon, after collecting his suspended grandson from school, Joe Pittman, believing that Christopher needed stronger punishment, spanked him hard with a wooden paddle, and sent him to bed early. Later that night, Christopher quietly left his room, and took his grandfather's shotgun from the wooden gun rack in the living room. He then calmly walked into his grandparents' bedroom, and shot down at them several times. The first two shots killed them instantly, but he fired several more shots into their dead bodies. Before driving away in his grandparents' car, he poured petrol throughout the house, and set it ablaze. Later that night, 
Christopher was pulled over by a police officer after being caught driving dangerously. When asked why he was out driving alone, Christopher spun a story about a large black man, who had murdered his grandparents and then taken him hostage. After further questioning, it became clear that his story was a lie, and he was soon confessing to the murders. He told officers that his grandparents were killed, because they had deserved to die. Christopher Pittman's trial was not centered on proving his guilt, as he had already confessed. Instead, it was to determine whether his medication had caused him to commit murder. When Christopher's father took the stand, he claimed it was evident that the increased dosage of Zoloft was the reason his son was a murderer, seeing how it happened just days afterwards. He believed his son, although troubled, never expressed anger or hate for anyone, and that the only reasonable explanation for this horrific event, was because of the medication. Despite evidence pointing in favor of the medication theory, Christopher was found guilty of two counts of first-degree murder, and sentenced to a minimum of 30 years imprisonment. However, Christopher's new legal team filed numerous complaints, stating that the previous trial was unfair, and that the jury were biased and unwilling to listen to any evidence that was in favor of the accused. They also dismantled his former counsel, calling them inadequate and unprepared for a case of this magnitude. The complaints were noted, and Christopher was granted a new trial. Instead of facing a whole new trial, Christopher agreed to the lesser charge of voluntary manslaughter, and received a 25-year term. It is believed that his release date will be 22nd of February, 2023. In February, 1988, 16-year-old Rochester, Minnesota resident David Brom, murdered his parents and two siblings, in cold blood. Arguments in the Brom household, were not uncommon, but on the 17th of February 1988, David and his father Bernard, had a particularly heated confrontation. After they screamed back and forth at each other, David quickly became physical, trying to attack his father. Bernard, not wanted to hurt his son, backed off and went up to bed, trying to give his son time to cool off. He had hoped that by leaving the conflict, the situation was dealt with, or at least, forgotten. However, in reality, the situation was far from forgotten. David spent that evening secretly cursing his father, and boiled with rage and frustration. After several hours, David entered the basement of his home, and retrieved the axe that was stored there for cutting wood. He then went to his parents' bedroom and attacked his father. He quickly subdued Bernard with several hard strikes to his head and chest. As his father lay dying, he turned to his mother, and attacked her too. His mother, Paulette, sustained catastrophic damage to her head, and she and her husband died within minutes. Walking in somewhat of a haze, David left the bodies of his parents, and walked to his bedroom. After several minutes, he heard a commotion upstairs, and upon entering his parents' room, he found his 13-year-old sister, Diane, and his 11-year-old brother, Richard, standing by the blood-splattered bed. Without warning, David began to swing the axe again, and made quick work of murdering his siblings. The following day, whilst hanging out with friends, David began making boasts, telling his friends that he had murdered his family. They all sat and listened to the gruesome details, but believed them to be a fabrication, as David was known to often make things up for attention. However, one of his friends believed it enough to telephone authorities, and reported what he had been told. Police officers were sent to the Brahm household, where they found the four bodies. David Brahm was quickly arrested and charged with murder. Although David was 16 at the time of the murders, due to the severity of the crimes, he was charged as an adult. At trial, his defense pleaded insanity, but the prosecution were able to show premeditation before the act, and drew attention to his unrepentant attitude, and cold demeanor after slaying his family. David was found guilty and convicted of first-degree murder, and ordered to serve at least 52 years in prison. He is currently serving his sentence at the Minnesota Correctional Facility in Stillwater. On 3 October, 2012, a 911 operator received a call from 17-year-old Jake Evans. Speaking in a soft, absent voice, he calmly explains that he had just murdered his mother and 15-year-old sister. Jake Evans was never known to have suffered from any mental ill health before the killings, but something in him snapped that day. In his written confession, Evans states that after he shot his mother and sister, he ran into his bedroom and started to scream. 
It was then that he heard his sister groaning from the other room, and realized that she was still alive. Evans wrote, While I loaded the gun back up, I was shouting that I was sorry, and then ran as fast as I could to kill her. I made sure my mom was dead, and shot her again in the head. The bodies of Jamie Evans, and her 15-year-old daughter Mallory, were found at their home at River Creek Lane, Annetta South Texas. Jake Evans was waiting for police inside and he was arrested without incident. After his arrest, Jake did not offer any clear motive for the killing, only that he had watched the 2007 Rob Zombie film, Halloween several times before he shot and killed his family members. In his confession, when talking about the film, he said, while watching it, I was amazed at how at ease the boy was during the murders, and how little remorse he had afterward. I was thinking to myself, it would be the same for me when I kill someone. Evans would later tell investigators that his mother and sister were not the only people he had planned on killing. He said he wanted to murder his grandparents and older sister, but luckily, he was unable to reach them. During his interrogation, and after officers consulted several psychiatric professionals, it was ruled that Jake was incompetent to stand trial, and was ordered to stay at a psychiatric hospital, to undergo a series of evaluations and treatments. After spending almost three years in hospital, medical professionals filed a final evaluation report, which stated that Jake Evans had finally been restored to competency, and was now fit to stand trial. After making a plea deal with the prosecution, Evans pled guilty to the two murders, and was sentenced to 45 years in prison. He was ordered to serve at least half of his sentence, before being considered for parole. On April 23, 2006, the bodies of Mark Richardson, his wife Deborah, and their eight-year-old son Jacob, were found in the basement of their home. The other Richardson family member, 12-year-old Jasmine, was missing and presumed to be either kidnapped or murdered. However, after a short investigation, and after officers spoke to Jasmine Richardson's friends, they knew that she was likely to be the perpetrator, not victim. It became apparent that there was serious stress in the Richardson household, after Mark and Deborah discovered Jasmine had a much older boyfriend. Jeremy Steinke, who was 23 years old, met 12-year-old Jasmine at a rock concert. They spent endless nights talking online, which is where Jeremy proclaimed to be a 300-year-old werewolf. After they caught the two talking, Jasmine's parents forbid the relationship, and did their best to stop the pair talking. However, Jasmine and Jeremy found ways to communicate, and in doing so, devised a plan to murder Jasmine's parents. Investigating officers would later find an online conversation between the couple, where Jasmine told her boyfriend, I have this plan. It begins with me killing them, and ends with me living with you. On the night of the murder, Jasmine unlocked the back door of her home, and later that night, Steinke let himself in. Armed with a knife, he savagely attacked the couple, stabbing them multiple times in the chest, stomach and neck. When Jasmine's parents were dead, they went upstairs, where they found Jacob, hysterical and hiding in his bedroom. Both Jasmine and Jeremy later confessed that Jacob was aware that his parents were dead, as he had heard them screaming. When Jacob saw the killers enter his bedroom, he screamed, I'm scared. I'm too young to die. Jasmine later said that she believed it would be cruel to let her brother live without his parents, so she stabbed him in the chest several times, before Jeremy slit the boy's throat. Witnesses would later testify that they saw Jasmine and Jeremy just hours after the triple murder, laughing and kissing at a nearby restaurant. When the pair were arrested, officers discovered an abundance of evidence that proved the couple had been planning the murders for some time. Being much older, many officers assumed that Jeremy was the main instigator, but the evidence proved that they were both as keen as the other. Despite that, being just 12 years old, Jasmine could only be sentenced to a mere 10 years behind bars, if found guilty. In June of 2007, a now 14-year-old Jasmine Richardson went on trial. She pled not guilty to all three counts of first-degree murder. After a trial lasting a month, and after just three hours of jury deliberation, she was found guilty on all counts. She received the maximum sentence of 10 years. She remains the youngest ever person convicted of multiple murders in Canadian history. In December of 2008, Jeremy Steinke was found guilty on three counts of first-degree murder, and was sentenced to three concurrent life terms. He was ordered to serve at least 25 years behind bars, before being made eligible for parole. In the fall of 2011, Jasmine Richardson was released from prison, and it's reported that her rehabilitation is going well.
On the 19th of January 2013, in South Valley, New Mexico, 15-year-old Nehemiah Griego shot and killed his parents and three younger siblings, 9-year-old Zephaniah, 5-year-old Yael, and 2-year-old Angelina. On the evening of the 19th of January, Nehemiah broke into his family's locked gun crate and retrieved an AR-15 type semi-automatic rifle. Gun in hand, he crept into his parents' bedroom where he found his mother asleep. He aimed the gun, looked through the scope, and shot her in the head, killing her instantly. Later, Nehemiah told police that after he shot his mother, he heard his brother Zephaniah cry out from his bedroom. He first went in to comfort him, cuddled him, and told him everything would be fine. No one knows what exactly happened, but Nehemiah turned the gun on his brother too, shooting him several times. With that done, he turned his attention to his two young sisters, who he found cowering under blankets. He took him and shot them both in the head. For the next four hours, Nehemiah sat and waited for his father to return home from his shift at a homeless shelter. He eventually came home around 5 p.m. and was met with a hail of bullets. Greg Griego suffered several injuries, which proved fatal. Later that day, he drove his parents' truck to church to see his girlfriend. Once there, he told her that his family were dead, but said they had died in a car crash. A parishioner overheard their conversation and alerted authorities. Police were sent to the Griego home where they found all five bodies. Nehemiah was apprehended at the church and arrested. Nehemiah was booked into the Bernalillo County Juvenile Detention Center and charged with murder. He agreed to talk to officers without an adult or lawyer present, and told them that he was angry with his mother, and that he suffered with suicidal and homicidal thoughts. Other than that, no clear motive was ever given. His girlfriend later contacted the police, and informed them that Nehemiah had emailed her a photograph of his dead mother. In the email, Nehemiah told her that his intention had been to leave town, kill more people, and die in a gun battle with SWAT officers. Thankfully, he never got the chance to carry out this plan. Setting a trial for Nehemiah was tricky, as there were so many mental health evaluations to undertake. Being just 15 at the time of the murders, the judicial system was hesitant about giving him a life sentence. Due to his age, under New Mexico law, any minor charged with first-degree murder are to be tried as adults, but cannot be sentenced to death or life without the possibility of parole. On February 11, 2016, Judge John J. Romero of the New Mexico Children's Court determined that Nehemiah was amenable to treatment. This meant that he would be tried as a juvenile and would be released when he turns 21 years old. However, in 2019, Judge Elisa Hart filed an order in a separate court that reversed the order that Griego was given previously. She believed that he was not amenable to treatment and should be in prison, not in an unlocked facility. If the order was approved, Nehemiah faced a sentence of up to 120 years in prison. The order was indeed listened to, and as a result, Nehemiah was sentenced to three concurrent life sentences, plus seven years. He must serve at least 30 years behind bars, before being eligible for parole. He is currently imprisoned in the Lew County Correctional Center, in Vanceburg, Kentucky. Zachary Davis is probably one of the most recognizable killers on this list, in large part due to his appearance on The Dr. Phil Show, where he gave a chilling and rather bizarre interview, where he spoke in a monotone voice, bobbed his head, and laughed inappropriately when discussing the murder. Zachary was nine years old when his father passed away, and he understandably become withdrawn and depressed. He was sent to see psychiatrists, where he claimed to hear the voice of his dead father. The doctors reassured Zachary's mother that this was a result of his grieving for his father, and that it would pass with time. However, over the next six years, Zachary's mental health worsened to the point where he rarely spoke to anyone, found little pleasure in anything, and had totally given up on life. On the evening of August 10, 2012, Zachary, his mother Melanie, and his 16-year-old brother Josh, enjoyed a rare night out together at the movies. Everything seemed fine, and Melanie went to bed happy after spending quality time with her two sons. Later that night, Zachary went to the basement, retrieved a sledgehammer, and made his way up to his mother's bedroom. Without hesitating, he swung it down almost 20 times onto her head and face. When she was dead, Zachary went into the family's game room, set a fire, and quickly left the area. When talking to investigators later, Zachary admitted that he set the fire in the hope that it would kill his brother. Luckily, Josh was woken by a fire alarm and was able to escape the house safely. 
Zachary was found by police 10 miles from his burning home, looking disheveled and acting strangely. When police probed, Zachary calmly explained that when the fire at his home was extinguished, they would find his mother's body in her bed, and that her head was destroyed. He then told them that he had murdered her with a sledgehammer, and said, I didn't feel anything when I killed her. During police interview, Zachary claimed that it was the voice of his father that had told him to murder his mother and brother. When asked that if he could turn back time, would he change anything, he replied, I would probably kill Josh with a sledgehammer too. At trial, Zachary was given a life sentence, which in Tennessee, is a minimum of 60 years with the possibility of parole after 51. If released, Zachary would be in his mid-60s at the earliest. In 1998, Kiplan Kinkle murdered his parents, then committed what was, at the time, the worst school shooting in American history. On the 20th of May, 1998, 15-year-old Kiplan Kinkle, was suspended from school, pending an investigation, after he was found to have possession of a stolen handgun which was stored in his school locker. A friend of Kinkle's had stolen the Beretta pistol from his father, and Kinkle had paid $100 for it. Police were called and they released Kinkle and sent him home. Understandably, his parents were furious, and threatened to send their troubled son to military school if he did not change his behavior. According to Kiplan's recorded confession, he states that at around 3 p.m. that fateful day, he grabbed another of his guns, a Ruger 22 caliber semi-automatic rifle, and entered the kitchen where his father was drinking coffee. Without saying anything, he shot his father once in the back of the head, killing him instantly. Kip sat and waited for his mother to return home from work, which she did at around 6.30 p.m. He met his mother in the garage, told her he loved her, then shot her twice in the back of the head, once in the heart, and three times in the face. The following morning, Kinkle drove to Thurston High School, in Springfield, Oregon, and parked a block away. Under his trench coat, Kip had two hunting knives, his Ruger rifle, a Glock 19 pistol, and a Ruger Mark II pistol. He also carried 1,127 rounds of ammunition. Upon entering the campus, he shot and killed 16-year-old Ben Walker, and wounded several other students. Kinkle made his way through the school and entered the cafeteria where he opened fire. Several students were seriously injured in the flurry of gunshots, and one student, Mikkel Nicolaison, was fatally wounded. When Kinkle attempted to reload his rifle, Jacob Riker, a student who had been hit with a bullet, rushed Kinkle and tackled him to the ground. Several other students joined Jacob, and they were able to disarm Kinkle, and they held him until officers could arrive to arrest him. In all, four people were killed, and many more were seriously wounded. In custody, unknown to the arresting officers, Kinkle had a large knife that was strapped to his thigh. He was able to retrieve the knife and attempted to attack an officer. Whilst brandishing the knife, Kinkle begged the officer to shoot him. Luckily, the cop managed to subdue him with pepper spray, and Kink learned another attempted murder charge. On September 24, 1999, Kinkle pled guilty to first-degree murder, and several cases of attempted murder, and was sentenced to life with no possibility of parole. The only motive ever given for the crime, was found in a note that Kinkle had left at his home. Regarding why he murdered his parents, he spoke about being suspended from school, saying, I just got two felonies on my record. My parents can't take that. It would destroy them. The embarrassment would be too much for them, they couldn't live with themselves. Further in the letter, he wrote, My head just doesn't work right. God damn these voices inside my head. I have to kill people. I don't know why, I have no other choice. Serial killer Edmund Kemper, probably doesn't need introducing thanks to shows like Netflix's Mindhunter. But Kemper is a grisly anomaly when it comes to familicide, being how he killed several family members, but with a nine-year gap between killings. In 1964, after relations with his mother broke down, 15-year-old Edmund was sent to live with his father's parents, Edmund and Maud Kemper. His relationship with his grandparents was also rocky, and one argument would lead to bloodshed. On August 27, 1964, Edmund and his grandmother was in the middle of an intense argument, when Edmund suddenly turned and left the kitchen. Thinking she had won, Maud didn't chase after her grandson, believing he was just cooling off. 
She could have never guessed that Edmund had actually left so he could grab the rifle he kept under his bed. She never saw or heard Edmund come back into the kitchen, and before she could react, he shot her in the back of the head. Edmund sat with her body and waited for his grandfather to return home from a shopping trip. Later, when he heard his grandfather pull into the driveway, he raced outside and shot him, killing him instantly. After, not knowing what to do, Edmund telephoned his mother, and confessed to the murders, and asked for her advice. She told him to telephone the police and report what he had done. Edmund was quickly arrested and charged with his grandparents' murder. When investigating officers asked Edmund why he had killed his grandparents, he replied that he, just wanted to see what it felt like to kill grandma. He then explained that he only killed his grandfather so he would not have to find out that his wife was dead. Instead of being sent to a juvenile prison, Edmund was sent to the Atascadero State Psychiatric Hospital, to receive treatment for several different mental disorders, including paranoid schizophrenia. Much has been made of Edmund Kemper's intellect, and high IQ, and it's certainly true that his intelligence enabled him to be released from the psychiatric hospital way before he should have been. Edmund was given the job of helping doctors with other patients, and even helped the psychiatrists administer tests to other inmates. Edmund was able to memorize all the right answers to the tests, memorize everything that the psychiatrists wanted to hear from patients. When Edmund himself was tested, he was able to convince doctors that he was truly rehabilitated and was no longer a risk. On his 21st birthday, Edmund was released from hospital and sent to live with his mother Clarnell. Many of the Atascadero hospital doctors strongly recommended that Edmund was not sent to live with his mother, as Edmund himself had confessed that he believed he would either hurt or murder his mother, if she did not change her behavior. It was also evident that Clarnell was extremely neglectful as a parent, and had a long history of physically, and mentally, abusing her children. The doctors were overruled by the parole board, and Edmund was sent to live with his mother. Edmund had no hope of living a normal functioning life, when forced to live with his mother. Their frequent fights, and her seeming pleasure to constantly criticize him, pushed him further into a fantasy world, a world full of horror and murder. Three years passed until the fantasy became a reality, and Edmund began killing again. In the span of several months, he took the lives of six female co-eds. Each murder grew in brutality, with him not just killing them, but he mutilated them, dismembered them, eviscerated them, and decapitated them. He kept many of the severed heads, and would kiss them and play with them in his bedroom, when his mother was in the room next to him. He would even sit outside on the lawn, holding the severed head in his hands, in full view of his neighbors. He would later remark that each woman he killed was a surrogate for his mother. His killing spree came to an end on April 20, 1973, when he finally did kill his mother. When Kemper was being interviewed by police, when talking about his mother, he said, I couldn't please her. It was like being in jail, I became a walking time bomb and I finally blew. The moment Edmund Kemper finally blew, came after his mother had belittled and sneered at her son one evening, after Edmund attempted to talk to her. When she was asleep, he crept into her room and bludgeoned her to death with a claw hammer. He then slit her throat, decapitated her, cut out her vocal cords and larynx, and performed sex acts on the severed head. He told officers that he stuck the head on a shelf, and screamed at it before throwing darts at it, and eventually destroyed it. Later the next day, after having several drinks at a nearby bar, Edmund telephoned his mother's best friend, Sarah Taylor Hallett, and invited her over for dinner on his mother's behalf. When she arrived, he strangled her and hid her corpse in a wardrobe, along with his mother's body. He later confessed he murdered Sarah to create a story that she and his mother had gone on vacation together. After a couple of days on the run, Edmund telephoned police, and handed himself in. He had not slept in three days, and was mentally broken and exhausted. He told arresting officers that once his mother was finally dead, he knew it was all over for him, that his job was done. Local residents and police alike, were left shocked by the details of the murder spree. They all knew and liked Edmund, and many police officers drank in the same bar as him, even discussing the co-ed disappearances with him. At his trial, Edmund's defense claimed he was not guilty by reason of insanity. Although prosecuting doctors admitted that he suffered from severe mental deficiencies, they found him to be sane, and therefore guilty on all counts. He was indeed found guilty, and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. He is still serving his sentence in the California Medical Facility, and is 72 years old.